Thank you everyone for tuning in for VPK by Maharshi Ayurveda. I'm Valerie Brown and this is our Brain Health for Women Over 40 webinar. Now Ayurveda can help balance digestion, calm the nerves, it can energize or optimize metabolism, it can even help us with stress and sleeping better. But what does any of that have to do with brain health? So joining us today is integrative physician and author of the new book, Healthy Brain Solutions for Women Over 40, Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Lonsdorf. Oh, you're so welcome, Val. I'm very excited to talk about this topic. It's really important that women and their husbands also hear this knowledge and start to implement it in their lives. Okay, wonderful. You've been busy, too. The last time we had you on a webinar, you didn't have this book out. And then the next time we have you on, <laughs> the book is out. It's for sale, everything. Yeah, it must be all those Ayurvedic herbs I'm taking for the brain because I've never been able to write a book in such short time. But, you know, it's been through <laughs> the time, so. <laughs> true, true testament, Dr. Lonsdorf. Okay, well, let's get started with some questions. And we, yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing about what you've been up to and all of the information that we can look forward to reading in your book. All right, so um, from reading your book, uh, statistically speaking, it says that women, when we reach our 40s, our brains age faster than men's. Why is that? And what is your, what's your new approach for this as well? Well, that is the finding in the latest research that stimulated me to write this book, specifically aimed at women. I saw that research, it's uh, just about two years old now, but I saw it uh, early last year, and I was pretty shocked, actually. I, I just had wanted to think that, you know, menopause, as long as we take good care of ourselves, that going through menopause should be a natural thing, and I still firmly believe that, it shouldn't have to be associated with decline, but a cross-section of women today in our modern day life a cross-section of women at different ages from about 40 to 65 compared to cross-section of men from 40 to 65. And their brain function, according to a PET scan, which measures um, metabolism in the brain and can also tag and measure amyloid, which is this sticky uh, ama, we call it in Ayurveda, the sticky substance that builds up in the brain that can, um, is associated with blocking our thinking and causing memory problems and cognitive decline. So what they found when they did PET scans on men from about age 40 to 65 is that the level of brain metabolism throughout the brain, including the key memory areas, was fairly stable during that 25 year period. And the amyloid also was not increasing dramatically. It was pretty stable. But in the women, at the start, they were just the same as men. And if I can trust my eyes in, this, in the visuals, they actually look like their brains might have been slightly more active and metabolically active at 40. But very quickly, as they went through their 40s and then 50s, the brain, especially in key memory areas, lost um, metabolism first. So in other words, the cells we metabolize, that's a sign of good health. Even Ayurveda says that you know, good agni and good hunger and good um, uh, metabolism of the tissues is one of the criteria of good health. So the cells, when they're youthful and active, have good metabolism. Well, what happened at 40 was they were good, but as they went through that 10-year period, 15-year period, that metabolism slowed down and slowed down and slowed down in the key memory areas especially, indicating that those cells became very distressed and probably you know, were on their way to cell death. And the amyloid uh, increased during that time significantly compared to the men. So that's why the conclusion from that was this initial research is quite compelling that women's brains are very challenged, perhaps due to the change in hormones that's going on during that perimenopause and menopause period. It's a very stressful time for the nervous system and the brain. And now we see the effects of it, you know, in actual um, brain scans. Hmm. Wow. 
I think every woman, woman knows that they talk about brain fog or they forgetful or they're moody or they can't sleep and, and, but, um, you know, the actual seeing the changes that are really there metabolically was quite sobering mm -hmm. and why I decided to write the book was because there is research also out fairly recently that tells us and guides us how to support the brain to prevent memory loss and cognitive decline. And so women in particular need to know this and need to know it early, as early as 40 or late 30s to prepare. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Now, um, all, you mentioned Alzheimer's disease in the book and also when we've had other webinars with you, I know this is a topic that, um, that you're very well versed in speaking about in your research. And um, so it's generally referred to as just disease, but in your new book, you tell us it's actually more an imbalance than a disease, and even better than that, that it, it's, it can potentially be reversed. So could you tell us about those findings? Yes, I think, I think it's, a, it's a conceptual model, actually. It's like a disease we think of as, okay, we've got this thing. This thing is inside us and it's something other than us and we're a victim of it, right? And maybe a drug can manage it, but we're stuck with it. And that's how we always used to think about Alzheimer's or cognitive decline because there was nothing that had been found that could truly reverse it. Um, now, it's been discovered that the antecedents or the, the beginning phases of this cognitive decline that may show up like say at age 70 or 75 actually begin much earlier for people who get Alzheimer's later. And so that's why I say it's more like an imbalance. It's a process that's going on often for decades. Mm -hmm. And what drives process? You know, the term epigenetics is we have certain genes and some people have genes that predispose them to a higher risk of Alzheimer's, but many people are getting Alzheimer's who have no genetic risk. So we know we have genes, but we also have the triggers for turning on certain genes, right? And those are coming from what we eat and our routine and how, how we live our daily life and our stress levels and what we do to counteract that in our exercise. All of these factors are influencing our genetic expression. Mm. So I say it's a process or an imbalance. There's something very specific about that. Um, I will say that I think most people are familiar with the concept or the word amyloid. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. from, from you, yes. From <laughs> our work we've done together. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Good memory, Val. <laughs> so, um, amyloid is... Anybody who's been you know, dealing with um, Alzheimer's in their family or read about it has probably come across that word. And it means um, it's a type of protein that the brain creates that has been thought to be really the bad guy. Like this is the cause of Alzheimer's. If we could just get rid of or stop the production of amyloid, we, the brain would not clog up and the neurons would continue to live and be healthy and work well. Well, They've even tried drugs that got rid of amyloid. Like they would actually eat the amyloid up. Well, often people got worse mm. or in animal models, the animals would get worse. So why is that? Well, they discover that amyloid is not the bad guy in and of itself. It's um, a response to the body to toxins and to inflammation and challenges and bacteria and viruses and um, blood sugar being too high, a lot of different things that stress the brain will trigger this. And it's actually um, a molecule that can, in a sense, enclose or, or um, wall off certain heavy metals, for example, that make them somewhat less toxic. But amyloid itself, if it's too much, there's too much being produced, it starts to clump together. And then it really gets sticky and cloggy and damages the neurons. So it's really a matter of balance. We need a little bit of it, just like we, our immune system, right? We need to react against viruses and bacteria and we keep, protect ourselves from infection. But if somebody's eating a horrible diet, they may get an overactivity of their immune system and start getting joint problems and pain and aches and 
headaches and maybe skin rashes. Those are all signs of inflammation, overactivity of the immune system. Is it a bad immune system? No, it's, it's a bad diet that's telling the immune system the body's full of toxins. You better get to work. You got to get rid of this. So it tries to get rid of it, but that inflammation is the, the response. So that's why I say it's more of an imbalance and people should think of it as a process. A process can be interrupted. Process can be reversed. We just have to understand what drives the process and then take away those triggers. And often there's a lot in somebody's lifestyle that has been triggering it. Um, I would summarize uh, some people that come to me and I've been working now for almost two years with patients and getting really, really rewarding results. I'll tell you a few stories um, if you want, but I, I want to say that, you know, some people come and I had some people who really had never heard of Ayurveda and they'd been eating the SAD, the SAD diet, which in integrated medicine, <laughs> it's called standard American diet. <clears throat> we call it the SAD, <laughs> SAD diet. So this lady in her husband had been eating, you know, French fries and hamburgers and just, you know, chips and all this stuff for 65, 70 years. <clears throat> and she started to have memory problems and he brought her in and he started researching it and he immediately completely changed their diet. <clears throat> He's like a CEO so <laughs> of his company. And when he saw that he could do something about this, what was happening in his wife immediately, everything organic and threw out all the junk food, all the processed food. They're eating avocado and boiled egg and uh, salmon, wild caught salmon and lots and lots of organic vegetables. <laughs> and and um, th what I'm saying here is that our, he came in and they had a lot they could do with their diet. And indeed, a lot of her markers have already improved just because of that. But then I get other people and that's one kind of cause. It's called inflammation type. And she started also getting a little high blood sugar from all the junk, you know, sugars and all. So that's another cause of cognitive decline, stresses the brain. We can talk more about that. And then we have the people who've been really, really good. You know, they've been Ayurvedic or they've been macrobiotic or they've been whatever. And they've been so good that by the time they're 70, maybe, um, Maybe they didn't quite get enough nutrition because they were so careful to eliminate so many things from their diet. Maybe they didn't take vitamins because they kind of believed, well, that's not natural. Maybe they never checked their B12 level because they don't like going to doctors. <clears throat> this is a subset of people that we know, you know, maybe the yoga crowd or mm -hmm. some of the people, you know, we can get a little bit maybe too insulated and, um, you know, kind of the ideal of what we want um, our healthcare to look like. But those people often, if they're having memory problems, they're lacking nutrition. They're not inflamed. Their blood sugar is perfect. They don't, they haven't touched a cookie in, you know, 35 years. So, um, but their B12 is in the basement and their folate is low. And maybe they have high levels of homocysteine, which goes up when you don't have enough B vitamins. They don't have much zinc. They, um, they may be still low in protein and our brains need protein too to make neurotransmitters. So they're, they need a lot of nourishment often and they need to replace all those nutrients and replete them. And sometimes their hormones also very low. Mm -hmm. So that's another type. And the last type is the toxic. And that's um, people who just, for whatever reason, most of them don't have any genetic tendency to Alzheimer's, but Unbeknownst to them, they got exposed to high lead or high mercury. Or they ate a lot of fish with mercury in it. Um, that's not usually the only cause. Usually I'll say there's like 15, 16 causes that we'll find in any one person that we can correct. So, so but that's another a potential problem is toxicity and mold, believe it or not. That's something everyone should be aware of. Well, mold, it turns out, for some people, mold is not really much of a problem. Mm. It probably isn't really good for anyone, but depending on our genetics and our, how our immune system works, some people are really susceptible and will get a lot of inflammation from mold. And they may even get cognitive decline because that inflammation can affect the brain. Wow. 
And that I've noticed that cleaning the mold up in people's houses is a really key, um, key aspect of recovering their memory. And I think of one gentleman who had, he was in this category of doing all the things right, but he also went to his doctor, but he did have things we needed to correct. But he was um, at 72, running about five projects in his business, but having trouble at, um, in the last year being able to focus. And his wife said, oh, he would be surfing the internet half the morning and not really getting his work done and the emails done. And so she brought him in and we looked at a lot of things. One of the things was mold. And it turned out that they did have mold and they, hadn't, they thought it wasn't that important. And he also had some inflammatory bacteria in his nose, which can come often when people are exposed to mold or other biotoxins that can create more inflammation because we know the nose is the gateway to the brain, Ayurveda tells us. So we can put good herbs and oils in the nose and it helps oleate the brain and deliver good herbs to the brain, but it can also deliver bad things that promote inflammation and amyloid. So we cleared all of that up and I'm so happy to say it's only a year later. Sounds like a long time, but to get anybody better from cognitive decline in the past just usually didn't happen. So in a year, he came in and he said, yeah, I think I'm, I'm better. I, I still surf too much, but you know, I'm getting my emails done. And well, we redid his cognitive testing and he had been borderline um, what's called mild cognitive impairment. And this time he got 100% on the test. And wow. normal is you can miss four out of 30. And he did not miss one. And I will tell you, there's only, of all the people I tested on this test, maybe you know three or four dozen, only about three had gotten a perfect score. And he was so focused and he said, wow, I am, he said, yeah. I said, well, see how much better you are? He says, yeah. And I was really scared when I took the test last time and I saw badly I did. And then he said um, uh, that, yes, and I said, and remember you said you would look at, you would do the email, you were avoiding emails. He said, yeah, when I'd look at the email, I didn't really grasp it. So that's how bad it was. He didn't really understand what the person was saying and, and putting it all together. He says, now I don't have any trouble grasping. It's just, you know, it's just clear to me. So okay. this man, would have gone on in traditional medicine he would have gone on to probably go you know in 10 years from now be in some home curled up in a fetal position you know being fed and then die from this disease so this mm -hmm. is the this is the importance and the revolutionary nature of this kind of discovery that alzheimer's isn't a disease that you get stamped with you know it's not just something that came to you, your victim, it's a process. And if we can find out what triggers it and uh, correct that, we can turn it around. It, as long as we get it early enough and the person's young enough, usually, usually by 75, I've even found by 80, I don't think there's actually an end point. I've seen people in 90s get better, not necessarily as well as they were, but you know, start mm -hmm. to improve. Wow, and, and it sounds like there's a, like everything in Ayurveda, there's a balance there too. <laughs> All balance. It's all balance. I love that term. And when I, um, the innovator of this multifaceted approach to reversing cognitive decline, Dr. Dale Bredesen, in his lectures, um, the first one I heard, I was so um, heartened by his presentation of balance. And he said, it's really all about balance. I thought, yeah, it's all about balance. Here we are. It's all about balance. This is the, the VPK model, right? On the mug. <laughs> They're on the mug. It's all about balance. So, so we want to have a strong immune system, but we want we don't want to be excessively triggering it. Mm -hmm. So that's and we want to have you know good balanced diet. We want to have all the nutrients that we need. And if you're vegan, I would encourage you to maybe get some blood tests or for sure take a really good whole food based multivitamin regularly, so you don't get low, especially in B vitamins and zinc as you go through your life, that's very damaging. And make sure you get enough protein. That's also important for detox. Mm -hmm. that's, that's another whole cause of cognitive decline. So, mm -hmm. you know, Ayurveda is big on detox. We could, we could go on for another hour on that. But you, you asked me what you'd like to hear more yeah, about. That's another webinar. We'll have you back for that one. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, so in, in your book, you talk about cross, there's crosstalk going on between the brain and the gut, and specifically the bacteria at every moment. So can our gut bacteria or microbiome actually influence brain health? And how does that all relate to Ayurveda? That's a big question. That is a really super big question. And I will say there are whole conferences that are devoted to this concept of gut health and the microbiome. And a lot of it has to do with brain health. And we've always known that the digestion from the Ayurvedic point of view is key to health of the whole body. And now, um, for some reason, the term digestion never kind of caught on. It's not like catchy, but gut health. Now we have gut health. Thank goodness gut health came around. And this has been, you know, is just a huge area of exploding research. And it's very, very fulfilling. Um, I, I look forward to the day that um, the microbiome and the gut bacteria is seen as one of the dimensions of gut health and and also more about all the things we know from ayurveda like how do we support good digestive acid and balanced stomach acid balanced enzyme production because that is digestion too the bacteria do a lot of work on the food and extracting nutrients and even manufacturing nutrients but there is the underlying balance and health of the digestive tract. And I would say that Ayurveda has a lot still to offer. And in my patients, I, of course, have the whole Ayurvedic dimension as well as this um, recovering of cognitive decline program that comes from integrative medicine. I have the whole Ayurvedic because it addresses this whole concept of are we making ama or waste from the food? Or are we making good nutrition? Are we breaking it down well? And we have to address um, people's eating habits as well, like having the main meal at noon. And also one good thing in this program is the recommendation is not to eat for three hours before bed. And we've always had that principle in Ayurveda that we don't want to have a bunch of food in the stomach when we go to sleep because that's cleansing time. And now we know there's even a term for it, autophagy, which means that the brain cells actually do eat up waste from the day and from the past. They, they digest them and eliminate cellular debris and build up. So it really is that at night we are cleansing. It's a different biorhythm at night, a different whole phase of function. Mm. And Ayurveda knew that, uh, you know, 5,000 years plus ago, so they're just discovering laws of nature. Ayurveda is laws of nature. So they're more being discovered, and that's, that's wonderful. So in terms of bacteria, if there are an excess of certain types of bacteria, we could call them bad bacteria, um, there may be excessive inflammation in the gut, and they, those gut bacteria can produce molecules that travel through the bloodstream, and they can go across the bloodstream barrier and create inflammation in the brain and now it's known that a lot of um, depression even and mental uh, or mood states that are unpleasant can be triggered by uh, dysbiosis or imbalanced gut flora wow so one of the things that ginger does and we're familiar with ginger it's part of most of the ayurvedic digestive aid is that it promotes uh it's like a probiotic prebiotic it, it, it supports growth of the good bacteria as one of its many, many, many actions. There are books written about the hundreds of benefits that have been shown in research for ginger root on, on the body. So Nice. Nice. Okay, let's, uh, we have so much more to ask you too. <laughs> uh, now, in, in, in one of the chapters in your book, you pose a, a really interesting question. Is Alzheimer's disease actually type three diabetes? Is there a connection between how many sweets and carbs we eat and our brain health? Well, in the short run, it may not make so much difference. Although I think some people feel, even children, you know, you can see you give them sweets and then they maybe get hyperactive and run all over and then they get irritable and have a crash. and. So we do know that at any age, sugar, especially in a concentrated amount, affects the brain. And yes, this is 
um, a very big factor. It's not in everyone because not everybody has imbalance in that and they can get cognitive decline. But um, yes, Alzheimer's disease can be caused or a major factor can be how we're handling carbohydrates. So I have a patient who came in um, who was into early Alzheimer's and she related how sugar, eating sugar would cause an instant decline for her. And she was on a trip. Yeah, she was on a trip with her family, um, a vacation trip, and they were on a long car ride across the country and everybody stopped and everyone got ice cream cone and she just couldn't resist. So she got an ice cream cone, she ate it, and that was it for the next 24 hours. She was so out of it, she couldn't remember anything. And it really instantly degraded her ability to think. And it, there are two, two sides to this, at least. One is the excess sugar, because glucose, which is what we call sugar in, in the blood, is the major, pre well, it's the preferred fuel of the brain. If there's sugar in the blood, the brain will take it up and will use it for its metabolism. So it's, it's fuel, it's like it's gasoline. But gasoline, as we know, creates free radicals. It's not the cleanest burning, right? Like an electric car running is cleaner. So there's another type of fuel that the brain can actually use, and that's called ketone bodies, which are breakdown products from fat. So when it burns ketones, the brain is in more in a cleaning up mode. So if somebody wants to improve their cognition and they have sugar problems, then having long periods between eating, like from maybe at least seven at night, not eating three hours before bed, and then at least till seven in the morning, 12 hours or 14 or 16 hours, that's kind of a fast within that 24 hour cycle. The brain will kick into burning ketones at a certain point after about 12 hours. So then it starts doing house cleaning. So Yes, uh, sugar can impact and lack of sugar can impact. Now, what's the bad thing about sugar? One, it promotes inflammation. And if you get a lot of sugar into the brain or into the cells or into the tissues, sugar is sticky. Like, you know, if you drop some few drops of orange juice on the floor and you don't wipe it up right away and you walk over it the next day, you know, your shoe sticks to it. So it's sticky and it's sticky in our body and sugar sticks to proteins. So sugar will cause proteins to stick together. And if proteins make up our body, that means, you know, we're getting glue holding parts together that shouldn't be. And we're also maybe immobilizing enzymes that would be working to get rid of toxins or to build up our tissues or metabolize. So sugar is considered, uh, it causes aging and there's something called AGE, which happens to spell age, advanced glycation end products. That means these proteins that have been attacked by sugar and, and stuck together, and they are related to, to dysfunction in the brain and elsewhere. So we don't want to have big increases in our blood sugar suddenly because they promote this flooding of glucose into the cells and tissues. So yes, if we eat too much sweet and especially like in an empty stomach, we just eat candy bar, or we eat this ice cream cone, or even one of the earliest researchers on AGEs uh, said in his article, he said, I won't even drink a glass of orange juice on an empty stomach. And that was like in the 90s before we knew that orange juice, maybe drinking juices, maybe not so good, you know, too much sugar at once. And that's because it raises blood sugar so quickly that the body can't compensate and it can get stuck in the tissues. So the other side of the coin is insulin. And insulin is our molecule. It's a hormone that we produce when we eat a lot of sugar or we, our blood sugar goes up. And it causes sugar to go into the cell and then the cell will either use it or it will make some storage molecules from it. And basically what happens is if we're eating sugar all the time, now this is what everybody really needs to understand. If we're eating sugar a lot, even over the years, sweets, you're sugarholic or you're eating bread or you're eating things that bring up your blood sugar quickly, then your insulin's going up quickly. And eventually your cells say, you know, this is too much sugar. We don't want to take up this sugar. So insulin 
we don't, we're not going to react to you like we used to. We're going to become insensitive. We're going to resist your action. And that's when the blood sugar starts to go up and the insulin starts to go up trying to overcome the resistance. And that's the beginning of diabetes. So when that happens, when brain cells resist insulin, insulin is actually a growth factor for the brain cell. It nourishes the brain cell and helps it grow. So when the brain cell says, hey, we don't want to react to you anymore, we're, the, the brain cell is also depriving itself of a growth hormone. So that's the second side of the two sides. The sugar itself is damaging and then not responding or not um, becoming resistant to insulin is also um, a, a damaging factor for the brain or something that promotes atrophy. Mm, wow. So what is the appropriate amount of sugar to eat? Is it just dependent on the body, individual bodies and what you're able to metabolize? Well, yes, but what you can metabolize maybe when you're 25 and then if you just keep <laughs> eating it uh, like that, and maybe when you're 45 and 55, all of a sudden you've created a problem. It's like you go to the doctor and they say, well, your blood sugar is getting a little high. Well, that may have been building up for 10 or 15 years. All of a sudden you're pre-diabetic or all of a sudden I had a patient who was not barely even 40 and she came in uh, with severe foot pain and she could barely walk. She was, you know, somebody who worked on the computer all day and she had trouble even focusing because her feet hurt so much. I didn't diagnose it, but she came in having been diagnosed that that was the first sign of diabetes. She actually had gotten diabetes and not the juvenile kind, the kind that comes because, and there's some thought that some of the chemicals and um, GMO and glyphosate and things like that are actually damaging our pancreas. And so we have to be careful too in pure foods because we could get this diabetes too soon. We have this diabetes epidemic, even some in thin people like she was. Anyway, she came in and she's only in her late 30s. So she already had diabetes. And, you know, we looked at her diet. Of course, she had already made some pretty strong changes because she, she knew she was young. She could really be damaged. Well, the good news on a sidelight when we're talking about nerves is that implementing Ayurvedic herbs to help her nerves and also some special herbalized oils from Marsh, from VP, VPK, Mopi, um, putting them on her feet twice a day, massaging it in, and then also providing some nutrients she was low in. Just about less than two months later, she came back, and I thought this was going to take a year if we were going to be able to help her. And she was walking, and she said, I have like one fifteenth or one tenth the pain I had. And she said, this, is, this has been really effective. And that was rewarding because the doctor wanted to put her on a, a drug or maybe even two drugs to try to help nerve pain. Well, that, those were drugs she would have had to been on her whole life. And probably the problem would have gotten worse because she really didn't help the nerves heal. Mm, wow. It's always so great um, hearing from you, Dr. Lonsar, too, because you have such real stories to tell about your work with your patients that you're currently doing, which I think is a really unique part about what you do as you're in the field. You're actually out there working with people too, which is incredible. Yeah, so well, thank, th you. Th thank you for sharing all of your stories with us too. <laughs> well, you know, that's why I do what I do. It's so fulfilling when people come back and they're better. You know, it's just, and, and it's been a lot lately because I have quite a few people who've been working with me for a year and a year and a half now. And to see people, there was one gentleman who was, um, you know, he's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's at least three or four years ago. And he came in really depressed because uh, he was a writer and he couldn't really think much anymore. He couldn't be creative and he just sat home and he just sat there like this and his wife did all the talking and occasionally he'd look at her kind of like he wanted to say something, he'd say something and then usually um, he'd ask some question that, that I had already answered maybe once or twice. He just couldn't remember. And then two weeks ago, he came back and he gave me a book of his poetry, which he had written before, but he had this bright smile on his face and he had been going to the gym. I, I, I knew from last summer 
that he could go to the gym. He learned yoga. And he said at first it was very confusing. He didn't, couldn't follow what to do. And now he got really good at it. And he said, now he remembers the people at the gym and he remembers their names and their stories of their life. And he said, you know, what I really realized, and he's talking very, very coherently and very from the heart and very articulate. And he says, what I really realized is what matters in my life, what gives me meaning is people and relationships. And, you know, he just found joy again in his life and he could remember the people. And he gave me this beautiful book of poetry and on inside the front cover, he had written very neatly a long inscription. And he said, I wrote this myself and it was beautiful. It was coherent, good sentence structure, and it, there was even some creative, like poetic expressions within it. And he, it was his expression of gratitude because he had really gotten his life back. That's and wonderful. his mother, his wife said, well, he couldn't go back to work, but life on a daily basis is fine now. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Now, another question here is, can you touched a little bit on supplements already, but can supplements help with brain health or is it enough to simply eat our fresh, uh, healthy, varied diet? Is there a combination of the two? Please tell us your thoughts. Okay, I do have a lot of thoughts on that because I got introduced to VPK back in 1985 when Marjorie Kalash first came out and I started taking it back then and researching the herbs. And by 1987, I started my practice. So then I started using them with patients. So I very strongly feel that just taking herbs and not having adequate nutrition is not enough. And I even saw some of the great Vijas who are mentors and legacy physicians of Marsha Ayurveda, such as Vidhi Triguna take the pulse of somebody and say, you're eating herbs instead of food. <laughs> so, so yes, he gave a lot of herbs, but he wanted people to eat. You have to have the proper nutrition. So that is important. You can't take that away, Val. That's a great question. You really need adequate nutrition. And I say that especially for people who are very careful with their diet to be pure that you still have to make sure you're getting enough of these protein and vitamins and minerals and all that. So, but given that, I feel in today's world, we are challenged by so many toxins, including EMF, which Ayurveda mentioned a type of ama in a sense that comes from EMF or those, you know, imbalanced by subtle vibrations and toxicity from the environment. Also, even the best, purest food that we have, um, research on organic food and children and the level of pesticides in their urine found that there still was a small amount, maybe one-sixth the pesticides. But <clears throat> there's drift, pesticide drift that, you know, can go from one field through the air and land on another crop and all of those things. So as much as we try, you know, maybe we travel and we're starved and we eat something. So I think that herbs are really important and if i were to recommend any if somebody were only to take one herb say they say I, i'm gonna take one thing then that one thing should be the amrit kalash and of course amrit kalash is two things it's it's two formulas one's called the ambrosia and ambrosia by the way if you want to figure out ambrosia and nectar and try to keep them straight it's really hard but the way i keep it straight is ambrosia means food of the gods and nectar is, it implies liquid. It's, it's like drink of the gods. So because the paste is more liquidy, so that's the nectar, and the ambrosia, the little tablet, the little round tablet has always been a tablet that's always dry, so that's the food, so that's ambrosia. So that's how I remember it. So ambrosia, I'm talking especially if you only took one formula, first take the nectar. And you take it either as a paste. If you're young, you have good metabolism, you're very physically active, then, uh, and you don't have any trouble with metabolizing sugar or ghee, then I think the paste overall is better because it's nourishing and it was designed by an ancient formula to be most bioavailable in that form. 
So the pace, that black pace twice a day. Now, if for any reason you're sensitive to sugar or ghee, or you just you think it stains your teeth or whatever your problem is with it, you know, I say take the, the tablet form of the paste. It's the same herbs, but without the gear sugar. It's a nice big long tablet and it has equal effects. In fact, in some of the animal studies, some of the effects were even stronger than the paste. So I asked the researcher, Hari Sharma, who did most of the research on Amrit, especially in the early days of research, 90s, he said, you know, the tablet is equally as effective and even perhaps in some ways more. So don't worry, you can still get the benefit of those herbs from the tablet. So I say that one thing because it has a cross section of so many different herbs in it and the research on it is so broad how it protects the body from free radicals. And any of you who've read the VPK website know that it's at least a thousand times more potent than vitamin C, gram for gram. So if you took, so that tablet's like a thousand grams. If you took a thousand grams of vitamin C, you know, that's a concentrated uh, vitamin, nutrient, right? And, and it's considered to be very potent. So if you took that in the body versus you took the same amount, one tablet of nectar tablet, that's going to be a thousand times more potent than the vitamin C. So it's really, and it's, it's not only acting in one angle, like vitamin C has its one action or angle of action. This has so many compounds in it, it's acting through many antioxidant systems. In fact, it's stimulating the body's own antioxidant activity, such as glutathione, which is an enzyme in, in the body that detoxes. It's like our most important detox enzyme, it's glutathione. And when we're talking about the brain, the nectar tablet stimulates glutathione production in the brain and SOD and other enzymes that get rid of free radicals. So this whole cognitive decline inflammation creates free radicals and Amrit is super anti-free radical product. Mm -hmm. And that's, there are many other things like it has go to cola and Shanga Pushpi in it, which are prime uh, herbs for the brain and have anti-amyloid effects and effects to help focus and to improve memory and decrease stress and, uh, dec and improve acetylcholine, which is our memory neurotransmitter. That's kind of a simplistic way of saying it, but have you heard of acetylcholine, Val? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can repeat it 10 times at night and it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> Perfect. Now, Dr. Lanzer, do you recommend taking both of the the formula the ambrosia and the nectar or yeah, let me go ahead and say the second formula okay okay <laughs> yeah. good good question the second formula would be the ambrosia tablet and the only qualification i have with ambrosia tablet is if you are say over 50 and you tend to retain fluid and you have a high blood pressure tendency you want to monitor your blood pressure because in a few select individuals they may be licorice sensitive licorice causes our body to retain more sodium and that's really good for vata types who tend to be dehydrated and under retaining water um, and also it's really good for people with chronic fatigue because they have like a, an adrenal problem and they can't hold on to water or if people have um, some people come to me and they say, you know, I drink so much water, but it just goes right through me and I just feel dry. Well, licorice root can help balance that. So that's, it's good for most people, but I just put that caveat out. If you tend to retain water or have high blood pressure, then there are better second herbs for you. But it also has ashwagandha, is one of the prime ingredients. Ashwagandha, this whole formula ambrosia is for the nervous system and the adrenal system, basically. It's to support consciousness and support stress reduction. And those who practice meditation or yoga, it's good to take it before because it'll enhance the effect that your practice has on your nerves. It'll help promote that healing that goes on in the deep rest of, say, transcendental meditation, for example. So ashwagandha, I have to tell you a few things about it. It actually is named Withania somnifera. Somnifera means sleep because it's calming. 
and it helps the adrenals. Unlike most adrenal herbs, which are a little stimulating, ashwagandha actually is calming, but helps promote strength and stamina. And it also improves memory and learning in animal studies. It also increases this acetylcholine, which is the memory neurotransmitter, and it reduces um, free radicals. And the last thing I'll say about it is when the brain is under stress and it's creating amyloid, what, one of the things amyloid does is the neurons have these processes, these like axons and dendrites, they're like arms and legs that reach out and they connect to the surrounding neurons. And that's really important part of our keeping uh, cognitively clear and good memory and calcul calculating ability, all those things, is that our neurons are growing and connecting and really healthy. Well, in early stages of brain stress, those dendrites and axons, they start to shrivel up and they start to retract. And then eventually they die. So... What was found in an animal study, forgive us for, or not me, I didn't do the study, but since it was done, <laughs> thank you animals for devoting your lives, but it is something that has given us some important information about ashwagandha is that it actually, in the animals who were having shriveled up um, axons and dendrites, it actually caused them to grow back. And when they took the ashwagandha away, the effect remained. So it wasn't like, well, only when the ashwagandha is there, have they, are they going to continue to grow? No, it was like a, a permanent regeneration of the nerves. So that is, um, there, there are so many studies like that on ashwagandha. Go to Kola, uh, Shankapushpi, I mentioned go to Kola and Shankapushpi are in the nectar. Shankapushpi, I believe, is in um, ambrosia, certainly um, ashwagandha is. And ashwagandha is also said to be a very powerful stress reducer. Some, I have one patient, and it's interesting, um, one patient that it has tryptophan in, because tryptophan is also a precursor to, um, to uh, serotonin, which is you know, important for anti-depression, right? So um, I have a patient who she says, when she takes her ambrosia regularly, she's so even. And when she runs out, if she runs out for two days, she starts feeling kind of depressed. And then she goes, oh, yeah, because I ran out of ambrosia. And so she takes it and she feels fine. And not like blocked, like when she in the past took antidepressants. She didn't feel like dull. She just felt like normal balanced. So I'm not telling people to stop medication that their doctor told them to take. But I'm just saying that especially for mild mood imbalances, ashwagandha, and um, ambrosia can be really helpful. So we could go on and on. One last thing I'll say about um, the nectar and, and go to cola, which is actually go to cola and Shaka Pushbi are both in one of my favorite products called Youthful Mind. Youthful Mind is the one um, that my patients most often over the years have said, Youthful Mind really does help my memory. You know, like they notice that they'll remember words or names better which are just common things that as we get older, usually names um, may not come quite as quickly all the time. doesn't mean you're getting Alzheimer's. It's just, but uh, that can be improved. And Youthful Mind is one that contains go to cola, which also has been found to help focus and concentration. So all of you ADHD type people out there or very creative people who find it sometimes hard to, you know, get your mind to focus on one thing, then go to cola, um, the youthful mind could be helpful in that regard. Okay, wonderful. Now, one last big question for you. <laughs> um, given that middle, middle-aged women can experience decline in brain health from fluctuating hormones, is what I, what I believe that you, you've said earlier, um, so then what's your take and what's the Ayurvedic perspective on hormone therapy? Or um, hormone replacement hormone. therapy, yeah. Well, this is this is a super good question, Val. Really, I'm really really glad you asked it. And if you had asked it to me about two years ago, you know, I would have said pretty certainly we weren't designed to have to take hormones, and we weren't designed to decline because we go through menopause. So I would have said, you know, we need to support 
the body with a good routine and good sleep and good diet and exercise and all that balance. And then a woman's own nervous system, endocrine system is designed to compensate our adrenals actually put out a lot of hormone that is actually estrogen and progesterone. So our adrenals are kind of our backup hormonal system. And when we go through menopause, our adrenals take on a especially important role because the ovaries produce so much less hormone. But if our, over, if our adrenals are stressed to the max, and I don't know many women today between the ages of 40 and 55 who are not stressed to the max. They either have teenagers, they've got very high power jobs, they've got aging parents or all three, and they are um, really struggling to have that balance of life, even if they know, many people don't even know what balance of life is. They don't know the benefits of going to bed early or eating their main meal at noon or all these things we know through Ayurveda. They don't maybe know how to meditate. So. So I would say that today, I think the adrenals are very stressed. And the first step I always work with women is to strengthen that through herbs and diet and routine and also improving digestion and gut health. It's key. And, um, you know, I use a lot of the VPK herbs to help improve digestion and get rid of AMA. And there are some specialized herbs I think are only by doctor prescription called the Veda herbs that you carry that I absolutely adore, and they make my job infinitely easier, especially with people who have chronic conditions or they're coming in kind of struggling. When they change their diet and they take these herbs for two, three months, they get this tremendous transformation. Women drop weight um, pretty effortlessly. Their skin rashes go away, their immunity gets stronger, they feel better. It's just a transformative thing. So. That's one of the things that I do absolutely first. And oftentimes when you clear the AMA, the waste and impurities from the system, you improve the digestion, you get them on a better routine as best they can. Maybe they learn transcendental meditation, you do stuff, do some yoga, morning walk, whatever they can do, they do it regularly as possible. Oftentimes their hot flashes will diminish tremendously and sometimes just go away, often go away. So to me, that says, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to that woman, you need also to do hormones to protect your brain, because that's what the research shows. I would say, look, you have created a more balanced state in your body and mind, and we expect that your brain is much healthier and happier because you're sleeping better, you're not having hot flashes, you're not forgetting things, you're not having mood swings. Well, what's to treat? But if a woman does all those things and maybe because of her lifestyle or maybe she's just got really deep imbalances and she can't get on top of her symptoms as much as we'd like or she says i'm really having cognitive decline and i want to take hormones well i based on the literature now that indicates giving hormones if they're bioidentical meaning they match the body's own that's a very ayurvedic principle right you don't give a foreign substance from the laboratory that is like a drug or chemical to the body, you give a little bit of what the body would make itself if it were a little bit healthier or more in balance. And you just support her transition. There's research now that giving bioidentical hormones during the perimenopause and early menopause years can help prevent cognitive decline later and also help prevent heart disease later. So again, if somebody gets in balance, they're meditating, they exercising, sleeping. I don't feel they need to take hormones. Hormones are a little crutch. Hormones are what our body will make if we give it enough support. It will make what it needs. So I see it as a viable option, and I no longer see it as something that is going to harm a woman if she really needs it and she's low and she can't make it herself or she had surgery and they removed her uterus or her ovaries. Mm -hmm. um, better to create, recreate as much of a balanced state as we can in any way we can. Mm -hmm. mm, wonderful. Oh my gosh, Dr. Lonsor, every time we talk to you, you have just this huge wealth of even more knowledge. It's incredible. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your insights with us. Is there any final encouragement or anything else you'd like to share? 
Oh, I just encourage everyone who's listening. I know that you're, you got access to this webinar because you know about um, VPK and Maharishi Ayurveda. And I just encourage you, you know, the best you can in your life to avail yourself of the knowledge that you're getting and try to align your daily routine to what Ayurveda has recommended and that you practice the stress management technique. I um, have practiced and recommended transcendental meditation for so many years, seen great benefits with that. Do your yoga practice regularly, exercise, that's huge for the brain. That's probably one of the most powerful things we can do to keep our brain healthy and our arteries healthy. And, um, you know, eat the good diet, just do the best you can and do interface with Western medicine in a balanced way, right? The word is balance. It's all about balance. I'm going to remind everybody it's all about balance. And that means even do prevention and get your body, you know, your blood checked and make sure you've got enough vitamins and nutrients and you're doing your pap smears for women and either mammogram or there's something called um, automated whole breast ultrasound that's much more um, uh, precise and accurate than just a regular ultrasound or than thermograms if you have dense breasts especially. So I think, and if you're gonna do a mammogram, take your omelet for a week, maybe a double dose before and after to protect you from radiation and some turmeric in your diet. Those things help your body repair from any kind of radiation damage very quickly. So we don't have to just avoid things that might save our lives, you know? So I just encourage people to have a balanced approach to their health. And mm -hmm. Ayurveda is a tremendous support, even if we're going through a Western medicine regimen because it's necessary at some time. Mm, wonderful. Thank you for that encouragement, Dr. Lonser. That's so important to remember. Um, now tell us how we can keep up with you because I know that you're busy now. <laughs> well, I do have a website. It's um, You can go to um, Dr. Nancy Health, drnancyhealth.com. And, uh, you know, I try to keep whatever are my latest quizzes or my latest, um, the book and talks and things. I try to keep that um, refreshed. And um, I also have a course, which we'll probably collaborate again with BPK. So you'll hear about it in the fall mm -hmm. on the brain. And I'm also giving just for fun. If you want to go to Switzerland, uh, contact me because I'm going to teach my brain course in the mountains of Switzerland um, in early August. And mm -hmm. Uh, you too, Val. It's, it's wonderful. The most on earth. I just created this course because I want to go there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, mm, that, anyway, sounds, yeah. that sounds great. And if people are seeking out consultation with you, is that is that still a possibility? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, you can reach me through my website, uh, drnancyhealth.com, or it's drlonsdorf.com is also will take you there. And there's a tab that says consultations, and that's how you, um, you know, reach us by email or our phone number. And I also have a practice in California, Southern California now, San Diego. I'll be there um, a lot of the summer. So, you know, you can catch me in Iowa or in California. Okay, sounds wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lonstor, for being here and for your time. We appreciate you. We're I appreciate you. <laughs> we're always glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank and thank you everyone that tuned in for this webinar as well. We appreciate your interest in the knowledge pieces that we are providing. If you have ideas about future webinars that you'd like to see, please let us know. Thanks everyone. Be healthy. Bye. <laughs>